I was teaching at any one of, like, Texas A&M or University of Illinois, University of Wisconsin, which I seem to have an open door quite over a quarter year period. And I'm going to start the same way I would there. And I usually start the same. I don't claim to be an ex expert in, any, in anything. I do know quite a bit about what I'm talking about. Although 10 years ago, I knew everything about this subject. But it's what you learn after you know it all that really counts, isn't it? So I tell them, the only thing is, my only claim to intelligence is, one night, 1945, in New York City, I got down on my knees alongside of a hotel room bed. I confessed my sins to the Lord Jesus. I asked him to have mercy on my poor, sinful, selfish soul, and have mercy upon me, and forgive me because he died for me, and he died for you. And I asked him to save me there. He did it, not because I deserved it, but, but because he died for me. And God saved by his grace. I couldn't earn it. I preached for him 3,000 years. So I'm like this at America Gold. I can say I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I talk a lot about money in my lectures. I want you to know I don't worship money, but it sure soothes my wife's nerves. <laughs> Nothing wrong with talking about money, as long as you don't worship it. Money is not the root of all evil. It's the love of money, the supreme regard for it. The fact is, when you run a corporation, I'm going to show you that you owe a profit to nine different areas when you run a company. Such as, I won't give you all nine, but the stockholders, don't they re deserve a profit? They certainly do. They could have gone to Las Vegas or the Bahamas and dissipated their money away in gambling and all those lewd shows, all that terribleness, but they didn't. They put it in the bank or they put it in the company, they bought stock and that provided jobs for you and for me. I don't like these kind of politicians that say, when they start giving tax breaks to the rich, I'm talking about Tip O'Neill, he says, oh, you make the rich richer and you make the poor poor. That's not true. When you give the rich tax breaks, they plow that money back into companies and you and I get a job out of it. That's what we get. If it wasn't for those people reinvesting that money, I know a lot of rich people, and I, most of them I know got more money than they could ever spend in a right way. They pour it back into firms, and they provide jobs for people like you and for me. So this thing of saying these tax breaks are a terrible thing. No, they're not. That's what puts you and me to work. And work is not a part of the fall. Adam and Eve had jobs before they fell. And your work and my work is meant to be a blessing to us. And I can tell you, I'm 78 years of age, and I'm still working five days a week and sometimes six days a week. I love every day of it. I'd sure rather do that than go to the YMCA and play shuffleboard. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't want that. Now, I start with this slide. I say, when you run a corporation, there are two fears that you ought to have. Friends, fear is a wonderful emotion if it doesn't get out of proper proportion or balance. Every time I get on an airplane, I hope that pilot fears heights as much as I do. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope he studied the laws of aeronautics as well as I did. See, fear can be a very healthy thing. So the first fear is that they, you may someday, with all these socialists we got down in Washington, Lose your economic freedom. That's a real fear. Otherwise, if the government will take over and run your company. You know what the government can do, don't you? Well, you can ship a gallon of gas from Houston, mind you, from Houston to New York City, 
for eight cents. And you can't even mail a letter for that from Houston to New York. And furthermore, they don't know where the letter is when it gets there. And these people want to know where the gallon of gas is. A fellow went to the post office here recently, put a letter up on the counter. He said, how much mail is to Boston from New York? And the clerk mailed it, and he said, 29 cents. He said, that's terrible. It's burglary, robbery. It's, it's terrible. And the clerk says, that's not so bad, mister. That's only a penny a day. <laughs> you know, you know what an oxymoron statement is, don't you? That, well, a good one is postal service. <laughs> First, fear is you. By the way, we had 102,000 companies go bankrupt last year. Well, last year, in the first six months, is 52,000. It's not easy to run a company and make money. Not a bit easy. If you think it is, you're on track. Do you know six out of every firms in the first seven years they're in business go bankrupt? Six out of seven don't make it for seven years. But they still, they got a right to make a profit. Now the second one is, you need to fear is the loss of the need of your services by your customers. If you're still making buggy whoops, you know what I mean. <laughs> I often look at companies for people to buy. They want me to give them a, a technological temperature and evaluation of their technology. I often say something like this. Their products are old enough to vote. <laughs> If you want to buy a museum, buy the company. Say they went to sleep. They went to sleep. A loss of need for your services. Now, I was the chief engineer in New York City in 1947. And in 1957, I was chief engineer of a large engineering firm in New York City and Chicago. I went back and I took two years of engineering in 16 weeks just to bring myself up to date because in my engineering meetings I witnessed to the saving grace of Jesus and I wanted to be the best engineer I could possibly be for him, not make any bolder in whole school outmoded concepts. I'm still a consulting engineer. I'm on several boards of directors. I have 10 times the services to offer to my clients, my customers now, than when I did, when I was back there as chief engineer in 1957, director of research. What I'm saying is, friends, keep studying, keep going to school, train your mind. It's a terrible thing to wait the mind. My Bible says, let this mind be in you, which is also Christ Jesus. Is that right? Would you agree, David? Would your wife there from MIT, would you agree with me? I bet your boots you would. You know, if you've been baptized with the Holy Spirit of God, there ought to be some of his great intelligence and wisdom rubbed off on you. We won't act more ridiculous, we'll act more intelligent. Now, maybe we won't act like the world would think we should, because you can get real, real happy about your relationship with Jesus, can't you? I sure can. I delight more in that than anything else in this world. So I don't apologize for it. All right, now, if you hired me, come in and give you an ethics report card on your company. This is the way I'd start. Now, I would give you an ethics quotient. Look at the very things I was going to. <coughs> but then this one does the same thing. First, we're going to go into a definition here tonight. Most people can't even just spell a word, let alone define it. But then I want to get across the philosophical basis for your ethics. And I want to get in to talk about application policies. I want to look into your marketing. See how your advertising is. See if it tells lies, makes claims it can't back up. I'll tell you, if you want to have a good time, just read the ordinary trade journal and read your ads. 
I don't know whether it's the engineers or the advertising people, but some of them wouldn't pass a fourth grade arithmetic. They'll say, if you buy this tool, we'll cut your cost 400%. Tell me, how do you cut cost over 100%? If you do, you got it for nothing. Isn't that right? See what I mean? If you know any economics at all, you can have a real good, funny, laughing time reading the ads in magazines. But the outrageous claims that they make for the things they're advertised. It's going to cut your cost 400%. I'd like for somebody to show me how you can cut it 101%. If you got it at 100, you got it for nothing. Isn't that right? Now, oh, I was teaching this over in Hawaii. My wife loves Hawaii, and she doesn't exactly have to drag me there either. Now, I was teaching this a series of nights, quite a few nights. And there primarily were Christian people in the audience, which I like. But one woman was the number two person in a religious publishing company. I'll not name the denomination. She came to me on Wednesday night. She said, Brother Harry, this ethics is also already beginning to take effect over here. I said, what do you mean and how? Let's well, see the one down there. See these for the customers, employees, competitors, neighbors, and later I have it very plainly for your customers. She said, my boss came to me, now mind you, this is a Christian publisher. He got on me, she said, because I had all our bills paid up for the last 45 days, and he wanted them stretched out to... 660 days. I had been talking about that week and how many small companies have been broken by these accountants that want to nurse their money. And they act like they're parting with their wife or their children when they pay a bill. And they think that the way to make money is nickel and dime on the inners. Those are what I call nickel nurses and paper clip savers, and they save also rubber bands. <laughs> She said to him, aren't we supposed to be a Christian company? He said, yes. Well, shouldn't we do unto others what we want others do unto us? He had to think a little bit. Yes, yeah, that's a golden rule. Christ also said that. Even Confucius said that. Well, she said, you want me to really get our accounts payable out to 120 days and our accounts receivable down to 10 days. That's what Harvard Business School calls professional management. That is, get you everything, every people that people owe you, get it in 10 days and pay everybody out in 120 days. Now, do you want, do you want to be treated like that? I said, no. Then why do we treat our, want to treat our customers like that? We say when we buy from them, it's 1% in 10 days, or 1% in 30 days, or 2% in 10 days. By the way, if somebody gives you a 2% discount in 10 days, you should take them because you'll make 72% on your money a year. That's better than any bank, any stock company, 72%. And by the way, you're going to help the company stay in business and be profitable, and you're going to feel better, and you're going to sleep. You're not going to make the little fellow out there wait 120 days. We put thousands of small men out of business making them wait 120 days when they had a wife and kids to feed. That's not right. My heart goes out to the little guy. And let me tell you, I love to lecture for the American Association of, of Accountants. I give them a good spanking every time. <laughs> because that's what Harvard calls professional management. If that's professional management, I think I'd rather go get a job at picking something with the chickens. <laughs> That's not the way money is made. So this man over there, not in this denominational publishing company, says, all right, we're going to pay every bill we drop in 30 days. We're not going to ride people to get it in here in 10 days. 
Isn't that right? Isn't it reasonable? Isn't it intelligent? Well, show me something that Jesus asks us to do that isn't intelligent, that isn't right, and that isn't legal. So, we must have an effect on the world in which we work. Application policy. First, What's your ethics compliance program with your employees and treating them right? I'll tell you, I've, I've passed on about 3,000 engineers and scientists in my time. Sometimes got in on jobs of lower uh, job classification ratings. And uh, I've had the men tell me that we were hiring what they expected of us, of us the company. When they finished, I say, that's fine, that's wonderful. Now tell me, what should we expect out of you? Oh, man, the list is about that long. <laughs> <laughs> they want to tie us up, they want pension programs, they want this, they want that, they want three weeks vacation, they want a company car, they want everything. Every. But when you ask them, <laughs> what's your obligations to us now? See, the roof's not supposed to leak, you're supposed to have nice bathrooms, you're supposed to have nice cafeteria, everything in the Hey, what are you supposed to do for the company? That's just as important. It's a two-way street. It's a two-way street. About time somebody tells us that. Customers. I'm going to show you later. You owe a profit to your customers. Why? If you don't make a profit, you won't stay in business. And they won't be able to get repair parts. They won't come be able to get service on what they have purchased from you and it won't be able to come back two or three years from now and get a better product. You owe a profit to them. You even owe a profit to your competitors. Because a competitor is the most wonderful thing that we have in the United States because that keeps us on our toes. We, we've got to get our service to improve. We've got to get a better product. We've got to have better benefits. We've got to have better features. Because if you don't, you're going to get run over. I say, but you have to do these things. Well, people have said to me, well, Harry, we're on the right track. Well, so was the horse that came in last. <laughs> <laughs> but he's on the right track, wasn't he? <coughs> how many factories you know got a, got a written policy of how they're going to treat their neighbors? Not, not to pollute their environment, not to be dropping things on them, not to be doing this or that. We owe it to them to be good neighbors. These are our obligations that we have when we're in supervision and, and management of companies. Now, this all starts with what is called the Hippocratic Oath. There it is. Can you read that for me, Adam, please? Hippocratic Oath. Above all, not knowingly to do harm. Yes. Tell me. How can a doctor that signed the Hippocratic Oath before he got out of medical school, how can he abort a little innocent baby and be still an ethical man? How? You know, we live in a liberal, conservative day. We live in a day which the Bible said would come, they'll call black, white, and they'll call white, black. Now, here's a man who's killed 43 women. They don't want to give him the, the electric chair because they say that's cruel and it's inhuman and it's primitive. But here's a little innocent baby in the womb who has harmed nobody. And they'll abort that baby. I tell them they're not good Americans because we believe in life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, and these unalienable rights. Not inalienable. Put the I in front of it. That negates it. It's unalienable. That means that little baby and you have rights that are not transferable, nobody has a right to take them away from you, even a certain, even a certain. And I say, a good American cannot go along with this pro-choice below. And look how it is. What do they do? They say, you and I, we're old-fashioned, we're primitive for capital punishment, yet there's been books written that every time you electrocute a man that has murdered someone, you save 18 lives, one professor from the University of Chicago named Horowitz wrote a book that shows there's 42 lives. But you say, when you do that, it's 
But starts here, above all. Not knowingly do harm. We may do harm, just not intentionally, and it's not knowingly. Say, so if you turn these lights up here, up, it, I'll, they'll sleep better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you don't want to go sleep. <laughs> How many of you ever heard of that word right there? Now, I want you, not you. How many of you ever heard of that word before? Would you raise your right hand? You know, I can do that across America. 99 out of 100 never heard of it. That's the study of right and wrong. That's what makes right right and makes wrong wrong. Most people don't know. Even Christian people. I'll say, why is it wrong to steal? Because it says, thou shalt not steal. That doesn't make it wrong. It's in the Ten Commandments not to steal because it is wrong. That doesn't make it wrong. And we'll get into that later on what makes right, right, what makes wrong, wrong. But deontology <laughs> is a study of right and wrong. I would think Christian people wouldn't want to know that more than anyone else. You can come out the best book in the country, and won't sell 5,000 copies on that. But my life with Vogue, you'll sell a million. <laughs> Talk about having your mind in the gutter. My life with Vogue. <laughs> Something like this. Can't even get more. So, if you want to make the average professor today in the liberal arts colleges just talk about the word moral. Word moral. That's like waving a red flag in front of them. I had a friend studying. At the Brooklyn College, he graduated number two in the class of 750. And he had a Jewish professor that said there's nothing absolutely right and there's nothing absolutely wrong, and he was absolutely sure. So my friend raised his hand, was acknowledged. What was he wanting to say? He said, Professor, wasn't it wrong for what Hitler did? to the Jews and putting them in the concentration camps and taking their lives in a gas furnace. Wasn't that wrong? You know what this Jewish professor said? He said, it wasn't wrong for him if, he, if it felt good. He meant to himself, not the guy going in there. So I said, Mike, the next time our professor does that to you, I'll show you how to show, you, show him he doesn't believe that at all. Just ask him to roll up his pant leg, either leg, doesn't matter which. And look him right in the eye and kick him in his head real hard. <laughs> Man, you... When it doesn't happen, do it again. And about the third time, don't do that, that's wrong. <laughs> See, it gets out of the abstract and down in the concrete when it begins to happen to us. <laughs> Intuitively, they know there's a right and a wrong. Otherwise, that means knowledge you're born with. You're born with. If, assuming you haven't been educated away from it. I put that word educated in quotes. He was afraid I was going to kick him. I didn't. <laughs> now, my throat hurts me almost in the morning I wake up very much. And, uh, who would be kind enough to read that one for me? How about you, Cliff? Definition of ethics. Ethics is the science of the morality of human acts. Look, right there, you've got a definition. You've got a definition right there. I'll give you all the time to write it down. It is a science because it is a body of ordered truths. The order and truth being supplied by rational analysis of evident facts. And evident facts. You're going to see them as we go along. But it's a science of the morality of human acts. It might not be as quite a 
exact science, mathematics, but still in the science. When it gets right down to it, mathematics gets an indeterminacy principle and Heisenberg, it isn't an exact science either. If you know higher math the way you should, how about it? Go ahead, Claude. Like all the sciences which have for their purpose the assembling of facts, <coughs> principles and rules, directive of thinking or of acting, ethics is essentially practical. You know, we live in a day of manufacturing wise. They're, they're married to and they're enthused and enthralled with statistical process control called SPC. And I heard uh, Bob Galvin, the main stockholder and the president uh, of Motorola, say that statistical process control doesn't cost it pays. And, and that's that's a good that's a good statement there. But I have found this in my experience. If we can put a good ethics program and teach the people, it'll pay ten times as much to the company as a good SPC program will. Because before we finish here tonight, you're going to begin to see some of these things. Ethics defines a code of values to guide human action. It tells men the proper use of a man's life and the means of achieving it. It provides the standard by which men are to judge good and evil. You know, when Ronald Reagan spoke uh, down in Orlando, the National Convention of Evangelicals, uh, he called Russia an evil empire. And any empire that puts 60 million people to death because they disagree with their politics is an evil empire. But the liberals in that place bled all over the country, as if he was saying something there that was unkind and was untrue, but it was exactly correct, and it folded up like a, what? Like a $3 tent. <laughs> There are many, many symptoms of why that was going to be done. And a black writer named Thomas Toll, if you'd read his book on Marxism, which he wrote 10 years ago, you could have almost predicted it within a year. Right, one of the top three blacks we got in this, one of the top three intellectuals in our country today is a black named Thomas Toll. You can read him in Forbes magazine, a column, every, every copy, I mean every edition. If you don't know who the smartest man is in the United States, it's a black, Thomas Sowell. An act that is morally right is always good for us in the truest sense. An act that is morally wrong is always bad for us in the most important of ways, even though it may be productive of some passing good of a lower order. Now, what do you think of that, that first statement? Somebody read it and discuss that sentence with me. I don't expect you to sit there and agree with me on everything. Think it through. Think about what that sentence is saying. An act that is morally right is always good for us in the truest sense. It's good for us. Like God says, I command thee this day, my law, for thy good always. And how about that yellow line up, so, up over the hill and around the curve? which the state highway puts there. Isn't that for our good? The other people coming this way and for those riding with us and those riding, driving behind it, isn't that for our good? Now, if you get over that yellow line, you just are stupid. Isn't that right? Well, all sin is stupid. That's just plain breaking the law there, but it is never, never intelligent. It's for our good always. But look at the next part. An act that is morally wrong, is always bad for us in the most important way, even though it may be productive of some passing good of a, get this, a lower order. Well, there's many a man in the tavern tonight going to pick up a woman that he shouldn't have anything to do with. He's going to go to bed with her and going to have a little fun for 10 minutes. But three weeks from now, he's going to wake up hurting, maybe hurting the rest of his life. He may go to hell for it, too, if he doesn't get forgiveness. See what I'm saying? When we choose an act, we're choosing a primary consequence and a secondary consequence 
that may take 10 years and may take eternity before the consequences are stopped. When we choose an act, whether good or bad, we're also choosing the consequences connected with it. If it's a good act, we get the good consequences, don't we? We get peace and joy and happiness and health and all these good things. Yet then, when we go out and do something like this and nobody finds out it, we think we got away with it. No, 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 we don't get away with anything. It leaves a deposit in our personality, which sometimes drive men crazy. Morality is the goodness or the badness, the rightness or the wrongness of human acts. Good in general, as defined by Aristotle in St. Thomas, is that which is suitable to the nature of a being, that is, that which benefits or helps it, suits it, perfects it, assists it, or is necessary for its existence or operation. What does that mean to you, Cliff? That which is suitable for the to the nature of a being. What's a being there? The uh, sentient individual, somebody that knows the difference between right and wrong. All right, now what's the nature, though? Uh, he's endowed with will, intellect, emotions, sensibilities, or emotions as a spirit. And um, those, those things that are good are, are those things that support that. That's right. I want to ask me. Okay. <laughs> what do I mean by that word nature there? Something that has characteristics or attributes. All right. What kind of, if it's, if it's suitable, what kind of characteristics are there? Good characteristics. That's right, good characteristics. But I'm looking for another word from you. Nature is made up of two two things in nature of man. You know, that's right. The attributes of it also, the characteristics of it, and the attributes of it. Those can be as different as night and day. Like I've, I've shown many, many times in engineering problems, a mechanism going to part, pot and the part because they're not using it under the characteristics for which it was designed to be used, and they get bad consequences. Like, for instance, you take your car out tonight and start driving down some river, it's only got that much water in it, and it's going to you know, hit boulders, and you'll get stuck in the mud. But you wouldn't get that trouble driving down a paved road, would you? Well, it's designed for a paved road. It's designed for a good blacktop. But an automobile is not designed to be driven down a river bed or a creek bed, is it? So what do you get when you do? When you go against the characteristics for which it was designed to be used, what do you get? Uh, terrible consequences. That's right. Many times I worked on big, big stuff, and when they said it didn't work, and I was chief engineer, you're at the end of the line. You go out there, you got to make it work. So I begin to look in first, how are they using it? Did they understand it? Did they know the characteristics under which I found some of our big new American control stuff going screwy, but they got a resistance welder 10 feet away that would, would put a TV station out of business. <laughs> Yet they send those spikes through our circuits and stuff like that. Wonder why it doesn't work. Never be designed to be used under those characteristics. You know, God didn't design man to live in sin. And it's unnatural, it's unintelligent, it's unreasonable, it can never do us any good. Now we're talking about what is good. What is good? It benefits us, it assists us, and even use the word that most people never heard befits, benefits us. Benef Everything God has told us not to do benefits us when we don't do it. But everybody, not everybody, most people think when God says don't do something, he's being hard and burdensome and rigid and unkind, and he's going to whack you if you do. He doesn't have to whack you. He doesn't have to. Because you whacked your own TV set. 
foundation or ground of morality does not come from the Ten Commandments, but from the nature of things or beings. Ah, from the nature of things or beings. Now, God knows how he designed man, he wants man to live. Man is designed for the throb of holiness in his life, to love one another, to treat one another right. All right, now we start stealing from another person. We hurt him, don't we? Hey, but we can't sleep either. And we start doing all these things to hurt him. Now, just because we have that in the law, in the Bible, that doesn't make it wrong. What does make it wrong? The nature of things are being. That's right. From the nature or the characteristics or the attributes of that thing which we're doing that against. That's what makes it wrong. And then God puts it in the Bible. Nature. By nature, I mean by the way things or beings are or their characteristics. Why do you think I say things there? What is beings? What does that represent to you? Human. Yeah, people. Human beings. The Bible says in Christ, in him we live and we move and we have our being. Otherwise, we have our life in him. Our life is in Christ. He that hath the Son hath what? He that hath not the Son that hath not life. Is that right? Well, that's what I mean there by the word beings. But what I mean when I say things. That's right. Inanimate things. What do we mean now, friends, by calling things inanimate? I can't hear you. I'll speak it below a whisper to me. Either that or I need to wash my ears. I don't know what to do. What? Living things. Non-living. They can't think. That's right, Carmen. They can't think. They're non-living. But wait a minute. It can have another meaning in engineering. I've had a lot of engineers that are inanimate. 